When I get the opportunity to speak on the Lord's behalf, I usually say, okay, let's give God praise for the gift of life, or let's give God praise for being a hedge of protection. There's certain things that you don't even know about that God protected you from. And when I say praise, I mean a robust thank you, okay? So there's a specific praise that I believe all of us can give God for. Everybody under the sound of my voice and watching online all over the world, how about let's give God praise that he didn't have to, but did anyway. <laughs> stop, stop. That was too casual for me. That was too cute for me. So let's, let's try it one more time. I said, let's give God praise because he didn't have to, but he did it anyway. He didn't have to wake you up, but he did it anyway. He didn't have to save your soul, but he did it anyway. He didn't have to keep you sane in the membrane, but he did it anyway. He didn't have to help you recover from that divorce, but he did it anyway. <laughs> did it anyway. He didn't have to cleanse my mind the way that he did, but I'm evidence that he did it anyway. He didn't have to keep me the way that I've been kept, but I'm irrefutable evidence that he did it anyway. He didn't have to make that bullet go another direction, but I'm standing here as evidence that he did it anyway. I feel like preaching in here on today. He didn't have to keep me sane in my membrane. That divorce should have took my emotional well-being out, but he did it anyway. He didn't have to leave the doctors and the surgeons flabbergasted because as they did the CAT scan and the MRI, they can't find the lump on your breast anymore. When they get the ultrasound, they can't find the cyst anymore. I'm not telling you about something that I've heard. I'm talking about miracles that have happened in our local church. Going to the doctor because you're about to get surgery to remove a cyst and the doctor says the cyst has dissolved. He did it anyway. And I got evidence. Somebody say I got evidence. He didn't have to, but he did it <laughs> anyway. One more time, somebody say I got evidence. That's where we're gonna park for the remainder of this sermonic presentation on this wonderful resurrection morning, I got some evidence because please hear me, if I was a note taker, I'd write this down. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Hear me, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence because evidence is for the purpose of you being persuaded. Did y'all hear me? Yeah. Evidence is for the purpose of somebody being persuaded. It's possible that they didn't believe until they saw you. Yeah. Evidence yeah. is the purpose of causing for somebody to be persuaded. Matter of fact, this is why I believe we have a lot of people who are disenchanted with Christianity now. Because the people who claim to have the evidence, with the way we treat people, it's not evident. <laughs> I'm simply suggesting the love of God and the love for his people should not be mysterious, it should be evident. There are three foundational scriptures that I want us to go to. I could not compartmentalize this to just one biblical narrative. Three foundational scriptures. I'm going to give you the scriptures, then we're going to go through them. Numbers chapter 13, verse 23 to 27. Numbers 13, verse 23 to 27. Then we're going to go over to John chapter 20, verse 1 through 8. And then we're going to conclude our foundational reading in John chapter 5, verses 5 through 9. Numbers 13, 23 through 27, John 20, verses 1 through 8, John 5, verses 5 through 9. Are y'all ready? I'm not convinced. Are y'all ready? Okay. Exodus, Numbers chapter 13, verse 23. This is when the children of Israel, they have 
not yet obtained the promised land, but they got some evidence of it. Numbers chapter 13, verse 23, it says, Then they came to the valley of Ishkol, and there they cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes. They carried it between two of them on a pole. They also brought some of the pomegranates and figs. This place was called the Valley of Ishkol because of the clusters which the men of Israel cut down there. And they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. Now, they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them fruit of the land. Somebody say fruit. So they came back showing them, now somebody say evidence. Then they told him and said, we went into the land which you sent us. And it truly is a land that flows with milk and honey. That just means this is a land that's agriculturally rich. We went into this land and this is its fruit. Somebody say evidence. evidence. So they're in the wilderness, not in the promise, before God gets them in the promise, he first shows them. <laughs> I really believe this is a prophetic sermon because we don't have the space to fit everybody at our local assembly. But sometimes God lets you go somewhere else, get some grapes. Come back and show, I got evidence that this truly is a land that's flowing with milk and honey. Let me keep reading. Y'all not ready. <laughs> Somebody shout evidence. evidence. Because remember, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Because evidence is for the purpose of you being persuaded. Now, John chapter 20, verse 1, says, Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early. While it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple were going with him. So they both ran, then Peter got on his Usain boat, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he's stooping down and looking in. He saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. As I was reading this, I was like, it's kind of funny. Because <laughs> if we went to a cemetery and I saw a hole, I'm not going in there. <laughs> then Simon Peter, remember he's the bold one, following him, he went into the tomb and saw the linen cloths. Could you imagine how bloody they had to be? He saw the linen cloths inside the tomb. Lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around Jesus' head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, saw and believed. Jesus was unjustly murdered. And I'm thinking, Lord, you could have taken the grave clothes with you, but all crime scenes have evidence. Somebody caught it. All crime scenes have evidence. He didn't just throw the clothes off of him. You have to think, when Jesus rose Lazarus from the grave and Lazarus came out, he said, y'all take the grave clothes off of him. Jesus is so boss, he takes the grave clothes off himself. 
and doesn't just throw them, but he folds them. Let me use a little millennial and Gen Z vernacular. Def tried it, but it got folded. <laughs> he folded. Looked in, and he saw the linen cloths. Somebody say, evidence. Because extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Our last foundational text John chapter 5, verse 5, it says, One who had been there, an invalid, for 38 years, when Jesus saw him lying there, learning that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, he replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Somebody say, Jesus didn't ask you that. <laughs> See, some of our prayers sound like that. We give Jesus reasons why I'm not at the place that I thought I should be. Jesus didn't ask you about, could you get in? Nobody helped you. They didn't come back and apologize. He didn't ask you that. He asked you, do you want to be made well? And as I'm reading this text, notice that Jesus doesn't even respond to this man's excuse of why he's in the condition that he's in. He simply tells him in verse eight, then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was the Sabbath. This next part is a whole sermon. I don't have time to preach it, okay? I need us to look at the next part. Verse 10. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, not, are you better? Not, I'm so glad that you're healed. Not, I see that you're growing. Not, how did you survive? They said something religious to him. It's the Sabbath. It's the Sabbath and the law forbids you to carry your mat. Now look at his response. <laughs> then the man, buddy replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up my mat and walk. Can I help somebody? Okay, y'all didn't say nothing, let me go over here. Can I help somebody? Stop trying to explain your call to people whose phone didn't ring. Stop it. It's, it's like unto you minding your business, you are in Walmart. Your phone rings, you say hello. Some stranger who doesn't even know you walks up to you sounding like they're a New Orleans Saints fan and asks you, who that? <laughs> who, who, who's that calling you? Wouldn't you be like, uh, excuse me, this is my phone. I paid the bill on this. So why are you responding to people in the comment sections who don't know you? Don't know what God told you to do. And this is why you have to be careful. Stop letting people talk you into disobedience who don't have to deal with the consequence of your disobedience. Picked up his mat and walked. What is this mat? Evidence. It's evidence. Can I go a little deeper? In legal proceedings, witnesses can be used as sources of evidence. Track with me. In legal proceedings, witnesses can be used as sources of evidence. Evidence can come from witnesses. You and I are supposed to be You and I are supposed to be witnesses of the kingdom. Because if you don't believe, once you just follow my life and look at my faithfulness, I'm showing you the greatest miracle that you could ever see is a transformed heart. 
The greatest miracle that you could ever see is a transformed mindset. I've got evidence, evidence, evidence. In other words, I'm a witness because I have evidence, because I had an encounter. I'm a witness because I have evidence, because I have an encounter. Let's say it backwards. Because I had an encounter, I now have, somebody talk to me, evidence which has made me a witness. Here come your toes. So everybody who claims to be a witness, but in their life there's no evidence that they truly had an encounter, they're a liar. Let's speak around this thought from this subject for just a few more moments on this Resurrection Sunday. I've got evidence. <laughs> I've got evidence. Can I get everybody to say this as loud as you can and everybody watching online, could you put this in the room in all caps? Can I get us to say, Father, thank you, Father, thank you. For, saving me, for saving me, even when you didn't have to. Didn't have to. I'm, evidence I'm evidence of your goodness. Of your goodness. So, I so I choose to be a witness. Be a witness. One more time, Father, thank you, Father, thank you. For, saving me, for saving me, even when you didn't have to. Didn't have to. I'm, evidence I'm evidence of your goodness, of your goodness. so I choose. So I Tap your chest, so I choose. One more time, so I choose to be a witness. <laughs> evidence, 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 evidence. We went into the land that you told us, and it truly is a land that flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit, evidence, Numbers 13, verse 27. The handkerchief that had been around Jesus' head was not with the linen cloth, but it was folded by itself, and the disciple who got there first, went in, saw, and believed. Evidence, evidence. Pick up your mat and walk. And the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. Church family, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I just want this to be crystal clear. We are not celebrating a cute little rabbit. That's why you didn't see any mascot in the lobby with a rabbit handing out some chocolate and some prize eggs. We will not let something as significant as the resurrection of Jesus Christ be eclipsed by paganism of a rabbit. Some churches do that, we don't do that here. We're not allowing paganism to eclipse the most pivotal event for all of Christianity. Let's just be clear. We don't only celebrate on today because our sins have been atoned. We don't just celebrate on today that the power of the cross has caused for us to be forgiven and washed. See, because this is why when Jesus was on the cross and they pierced him in his side, blood and water flowed. Because the blood is for our sin, but the water is for our life. I need them both. I need both the blood of the lamb and I also need the living water that quenches my thirst so that I'll never thirst again. I need them both. The blood is for my sin, but the water helps me 
think right. The water helps me speak right. The water helps me start to communicate with some emotional intelligence versus every single time I get upset, I'm bleep, 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 bleep. It washes my mouth of profanity. The water washes my taste buds so that I'm no longer drooling over cultural sewage. But now I desire the living bread and now I desire the living water. Not only do we celebrate the fact that our sins have been atoned and that by the power of the cross we're forgiven and we're washed. We're celebrating that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus hit hell and death with the hardest curve of all time by telling hell and death, you thought. it. <laughs> Think you got it. The hardest curve, I don't know if you've ever been curved before. That's millennial and Gen Z vernacular too. They kind of like dissed you, okay? <laughs> he hit hell and death with the hardest curve of all time, you thought. They're gonna be in bondage forever, you thought. <laughs> They're not gonna have access to the Father, you thought. <laughs> you thought that they're gonna be bound to sin, death, depression, anxiety, you thought. <laughs> we celebrate that Jesus not only died, but that he got up. Yes. Hear me, if Jesus didn't get up, us being here is vanity. Yes. If Jesus didn't get up, see, because most people know the Christian story, they know the resurrection story, but they don't know the importance of it. Yes. If Jesus did not raise from the grave, our sins would not have been atoned and we still have this eternal debt. Yes. But the fact that Jesus got up it's irrefutable evidence that we can get up to because watch this, God loves leaving evidence because it gives him glory. Yeah. Do you have Bible to corroborate your claim? Yes, I do. Interwoven all throughout the fabric of scripture. Why do you think God kept introducing himself? I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What is he saying? Check my resume. My resume. I have evidence of being faithful. I have evidence of being a way maker. I have evidence of being a promise keeper. I have evidence of being a strong tower. I have evidence of being a refuge. He leaves evidence because it gives him glory. I'm gonna keep on going. Why else do you think God told the children of Israel while they were in Egypt on that horrible night when the 10th plague was coming through the town and the spirit of death was killing all firstborn sons he said, okay, this is what I need y'all to do. Get a spotless lamb and put lamb's blood on the doorpost so that when the spirit of death travels through the town, when it comes to your house and it sees blood on the door, it passes over. Hold on, wait, wait, I gotta teach this, hold on, wait. This is how the Passover festival was installed. Because God was like, okay, I need my people to come together ever so often, and I need y'all to give me praise because there was a time in your life something should have hit you, but due to the blood, due to the blood, it passed over you. Let's keep going. At the Last Supper, what was that? The Passover Festival. So this time, y'all don't need to go out and find a spotless lamb. I am the spotless lamb. And now, blood is not gonna be on the doorposts of your house. Blood is gonna be on the doorposts of your soul. So every time God looks at you, he's not ready to render judgment because I see the blood which gives me Passover. Can we give God a Passover praise? There's certain stuff that should have hit you but due to the blood, it passed over you. Because God likes leaving evidence. Because that evidence gives him glory. I'm gonna keep going. Why else do you think that God told Joshua once they crossed through the Jordan, okay, I need you to go into the middle of the Jordan, get 12 stones to represent 12 tribes of Israel. You take those 12 stones and you place them over here. I need y'all to see this. Joshua chapter four. This is so good, y'all. Joshua chapter four, verse six. 
look at this, to serve as a sign among you. In the future when your children ask, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. What is he saying? Leave these stones. Somebody shouted way out in the balcony. I don't know. He's saying leave these stones because they are evidence. I'm going to keep going. I'm trying to get y'all to see this. Why else do you think he rolled up on Thomas and said, put your hands where they put the nails? Evidence. Why else do you think he told us in Matthew chapter 5, don't worry, but instead find a bird. Look to the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather in barns, but yet your heavenly Father provides for them. Are you not much more valuable than they? So the next time you begin to worry, find a blue jay. The next time you begin to worry, find a sparrow. The next time whatever, a mockingbird, a cardinal, a raven, a hawk, whatever you want to call it, if you can't find one in the sky, Google one on your phone. So that every time you feel worry and anxiety, a bird can remind you, I'm Jaira. And the same God that took care of a bird how much more do you think I'll take care of you? Every time you see a bird fly, I hope when somebody leaves here, when you've been tripping about, man, tomorrow's the first, how am I going to pay rent? I hope a bird just gets on your dashboard. Ooh, ooh. I hope while you're driving, frustrated about something, a bird just flies in front of you and you'll hear evidence. 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 Why else? Do you think God put you in your bloodline? Why else? Ooh, why else do you think God put you in that community so that you can be evidence? I feel this, y'all. Evidence, because extraordinary claims must be followed by extraordinary evidence. We went into the land that you told us. And you're right, bro. It's the land that flows with milk and honey. And these, this is the fruit. The handkerchief was not with the clothes, but folded by itself. Grapes, grave clothes. Pick up your mat and walk. Grapes, grave clothes, Mats, hmm. grapes, grave clothes, mats. Y'all say it with me. Grapes, grave clothes, mats. Okay, so what does that mean? I want to break it down where we can understand it. Grapes represent what God has for you. Somebody say has. has. You don't have it yet, but it represents what he has for you. Grapes represent what God has for you. Grave clothes represents there's nothing your God can't do. And your mat represents your testimony on how God got you through. Is this making sense? Whatever phase you're at, where you got grapes. Let's talk about the grapes for a second. These look good, don't they? They're no longer connected to the tree. I just got a piece of the tree. See, oftentimes in church, we do so much preaching about it's your season and, and it's your time and your breakthrough is on the way and, and it's coming. If you just shout like you lost your mind, do all of that. <laughs> and what that does is it classically conditions Christians to pray for next, but not steward now. This is still the goodness of God. This is personal for me. We're going to go right back next Sunday to Thomas Celebration, 10355, Mills Road. We're going to go right back to Five Overflows 
We can go right back, but God is saying, I got grapes. What grapes should do is make every parking lot worker have a little more joy. What grapes should do is make every choir member sing a little more passionately. What grapes should do is make every person in the body of Christ to, be ha to have a heart posture of, I'm appreciate the wilderness so that I don't miss out on the promise. Why aren't we preaching more about stewarding your wilderness versus getting out of it? We preach more about the next. But what do you do in the wilderness? Especially when God shows you grapes. See, if I was the devil, I would make you be jealous of everybody who has grapes and you don't. So that you don't get inspired, but you get jealous. Hear me, I'm trying to teach us. This is how God exposes you to next. He shows you people who have it. For you to take notes, not take offense. I'm walking around, okay, they got this. Y'all can communicate better. Okay, we need to take that back home. Y'all can do this here. Okay, take notes. Not take offense. Grapes. That, that's just God showing you. I got something else coming for you. Grave clothes. This means there's nothing that your God can't do. After we launch Symptoms, a series that I'm going to do during the summer is called Defense. There's this amazing man of God that's really just blessed my life, Dr. Frank Turnick. He wrote a book called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. Cross-examine is his ministry. He's powerful, one of the most profound speakers on apologetics that I've been reading. And he said, okay, make sure if you have an opportunity to stand on stage on Resurrection Sunday, you speak about the elephant in the room. Did he really get up or not? Because really there are only two possibilities when it came to the resurrection. And I have a chart. This is inspired by one of his seminars that he did at a college. Either the resurrection, it really happened or it didn't happen. Okay? Those are the only two possibilities. The reason we're going this route is because all of us will hit a phase, a season, or a valley in your life where you ask yourself, do I really believe all this stuff? Do I really believe? What increases your faith is evidence. So let, let, let's think about this. It really happened or it didn't happen. So if it really happened that Jesus got up this means, number one, the scriptures are true. Okay? If Jesus really got up, scripture is true. And if scripture is true, this means Jesus is God. He prophesied about himself that he's going to be betrayed into the hands of sinners, crucify, die, be buried, but after three days, get back up again. That's what the word says. So if it really happened, Jesus is Lord, scripture is true, and Jesus did get up from the grave. Some of us have heard that, but we don't believe it. So I'm going to talk to those who struggle with it. Okay, if it didn't happen, this means all the New Testament writers, they lied. <laughs> all of them. Paul lies. Or, if it was not a lie, they were mistaken. Okay? So stay with me now. If it didn't happen, they lied. Now let's think. Why would you die for a known lie? Come on. Like, it would have been better for them to lie and say that it didn't happen because they still could have come to the synagogue. They wouldn't have been stoned, they wouldn't have been beat, they wouldn't have been killed. So truthfully, lying and saying that Jesus didn't get up would have given them more glory. So why would they lie about making themselves look bad? Like what, what do they get from lying? Absolutely nothing. 
nothing. <laughs> what? Some of us have lied before. You possibly lied today. <laughs> Usually when you lie, it's for you to look good. It's for you to protect yourself. Babe, I was home. I wasn't over there. You lying. <laughs> it's to protect you. That contact in your phone is not really Domino's. That's really Sheila. You lying. <laughs> but why do you lie? To protect you. So let's think about this. Why would they lie? Go in synagogues, be beaten, spit upon, flogged, run out of church. See, we talk about church hurt. These dudes got beat up in church and ran out the church. Like, we suffer for Christ. What's up, bro? <laughs> I promise this new age Christianity, we couldn't make it in Bible days. <laughs> we couldn't make it. Oh, they don't have any parking See, This is why. I, I, you done. You done. You're done. The, I just wonder, like, when we get to heaven and certain pastors are like, yeah, I had four campuses. Yeah, I had three. I had 16. And Paul's like, yeah, I got beat up like six times. I got flawed. What'd you do? Yeah, we had thousands of plus people show up for resurrection. Peter like, yeah, I got crucified upside down, though. What'd you do? Why would they lie and live horrible lives? The only reason you're willing to get beat, spit upon, crucified, is there had to be an event so extraordinary, so amazing, that you recognize that this current life is just a glimpse I'm just passing through. I'm trying to help somebody who's stressed over first world problems. At the end of the day, this world is going to fade away. This earth is going to pass away. And God's going to create a new earth and a new heaven where there's no more suffering, no more pain, no more cancer, no more doubt, no more trauma, no more anxiety, no more stealing, no more murder, no more rape, no more molestation, no more adultery. It will be perfect and we're stressed about this current life. They had to see for themselves Jesus crucified, resurrected, and what they saw was so powerful that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. I'm not going to lie for me to suffer. I'm not going to lie for that. Grapes, grave clothes, mats. As I begin to think about this dude with this mat. Jesus, when he rose from the grave, he left his but Jesus told him, you take yours. <laughs> That's how I read my Bible. I went, okay, you left your clothes, but you told him, okay. If I'm paralyzed for 38 years, I want to throw this in the trash. One of my sisters said, I know that's right. I'm done. Why would Jesus tell this man, no, you take it. Y'all need to come up here and preach. <laughs> Not only is it for evidence, but it's also for evangelism. Yeah. Hear me. Anytime somebody looks down on somebody else, you forgot that you have a... So when I'm walking and I see somebody laying on a mat, there's another level of compassion that I have on you because what I'm holding used to hold me. This is so good. What I'm holding used to hold me. So now every time I see somebody, I make my mat a billboard. This is a sobering reminder 
of where I was when he found me. Now, I found you in the same predicament. Let me tell you how I learned how to walk. Is this making sense? If I go a little deeper, while this man is laying on this mat, if you study the text, this man was at a pool where a lot of disabled people were. And he's caught up in his situation. I'm just wondering, like, me? If that was my mat, I'm going to be right on the edge. So as soon as that water starts bubbling, I'm rolling in it. Could it be he was so discouraged? He wasn't even trying anymore. Don't lose your try. Talking to somebody, don't lose your try. He's laying here. Jesus walks up to him. Do you want to be made well? I'm going to raise myself up one day. But I get joy out of raising other people up first. Do you want to be made well? And this is what I believe he totally missed. Jesus walked past everybody else. He walked past, he could have stopped at him, he could have stopped at her, he could have stopped at them. He walked past everybody else. Came up to you. What miracle are you missing out on because you're comparing yourself to somebody else? See, because what we do is we compare ourselves to others when God compares yourself to your potential. The only measurements that I have, are you being obedient for the purpose of why you've been born? That's the only comparison I have for you. You're looking at others, God is looking at your obedience. Could it be the master is so loving where he sees somebody not even trying? Sister, discouraged, whatever your circumstance may be, maybe this is what Jesus is asking you. Are you tired of this yet? Are you tired of trying to live life making your moves? This storm is not the devil. It's me trying to get you to come home. You tired yet? For the brother, we're probably not going to see you again to Christmas. Just being honest, this could be the only time you ever hear a gospel message. So I'm going to make sure if that is the case. Because like I said in the timing series, you know how much money you have in your bank, but you don't know how much time you have on your clock. You don't. Have you got to a place where your curiosity is starting to transition into action yet? Well, when I get my life right, I, well, when I start, I'll do it. You don't come to Jesus once you're fixed. You come to him to get fixed. I'll share this thing that happened to me and then these points and we're going to be done. I met this guy. Uh, I was in Walmart buying some groceries and he walked up to me and said, hey, man. They, they, won't, they won't let me buy these smokes. Can I use your ID? I said, smokes? They said, yeah, yeah, I, I just need to get these smokes. I said, no, nah, bro, this, this ain't good for you. You know you're not supposed to be doing that. And he said, you're a Christian, huh? <laughs> Promise, random dude. Random. I said, yeah, but... What does that have to do with the smokes? I could just tell. You seem like you're trying to tell me something. Hey, bro, God knows my heart, man. God knows my heart. I, I'm probably going to pull up the service one, one, one day at some church. He has no clue who I am. And I'm not going to tell him. He, yeah, God knows I'll be trying. It'll just be hard out here, man. You know, and I just got to make ends meet, man. And once I get right, I'm for real, though. I promise. I, I, I'm going to surrender my life to the Lord. I said, hey, what if you don't have a chance to get right? 
That's deep, kid. It's <laughs> deep, kid. I, I ain't even thought about that. And I'm saying, doop. You never thought about, like, doop. This, this could be it one day for you, doop. Now, I'm going to be straight up with you, bro. I'm still going to get my smokes even if you don't buy them from me. <laughs> but I said, I appreciate your honesty. But one thing's for sure. You always going to remember our conversation. And the smoking ain't going to fulfill that, bro. And just like I told y'all, I said, you can know how much money you have in your, in your bank account, but you don't know how much time you have on your clock. Have a blessed day, bro. You too, man of God. You too, bro. You. What was that? Evidence. That's it. Mine may not have been cigarettes, but it used to be porn. And so anytime I see somebody with a mat, I always consider myself. And I'm thankful that I ran into people who are not so stuck up with their Christianity that they say things like, man, if you really were a Christian, you wouldn't struggle with that. The fact that I'm struggling with it is proof. So what's the evidence? Point number one, our love. That's our evidence, our love. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples by the way we love one another. What's our evidence, our fruit? Love, joy, peace, patience. That's not one, bro. <laughs> Kindness, goodness. That, that's, that's our fruit, our fruit. Some people will never, ever come to hear a sermon by me, but you're preaching every day you go to work. Every time you post, you're preaching. Every time you go to happy hour with them, you're preaching. Our love, our fruit, our serving, this is the evidence. When you recognize what God did for you, you can't help but tell others about this wonderful, extraordinary, free event. God saved me. And lastly, what's the evidence? Our witness. Three passages of scripture. Acts chapter one, verse eight. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be, what's that word? What's that word? Witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Evidence. Acts chapter two, verse 23. This Jesus God has raised up of which we are all, what's that word? Witnesses. Evidence. Luke chapter 24, verse 46. Then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached. I want you to pause right there. It does not say that he rose on the third day and you will get blessings. Harvest. Next. First thing, repentance. Why are we preaching that more? But I get it though. I get it. I get it. I know what increases likes. I know what increases follows. Keep telling people about the blessings of God. And what you would do is you would classically condition a people who only want the blessings of God, but they don't want witness responsibility. Your witness matters. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. What if you came here today and 
and God is simply reminding you, hey, you have an assignment. You got evidence, all you gotta do is look. You have evidence that I'm a keeper. You have evidence that I'm an awesome God. Now, in your life, can it be evident that you have received this evidence? I'm telling you, really with fear and trembling. But what's coming upon the land, your witness will have to be solid. have to be sincere. Either he got up or he didn't. And since there's more evidence that he did, where's that evidence in your life? I stand before you with an invisible mat. All the reason I preach as passionately as I do. The only reason sweat out my clothes each and every week it's because I had an encounter April 26, 2006 that's my rebirth day fresh from coming from the club about to pledge a fraternity and I'm going to lose a whole lot of followers for what I'm going to say about fraternities in this next series a lot of them recognized at that moment I thought I was saying as my mom and my dad were saying I grew up in church I'm telling you you can't get fooled watching somebody else eat there was no repentance in my life no turning away in my life that night fresh from the club cracked open my Bible I said God if I'm going to do this Prove to me you're better than this. Be better. This temptation is only hard when you don't have a greater than. Be greater to me. And I vow to you, until my heart stops, you crack the sky, take us home. I'm going to give you everything I got. I'm just one man. You have the same responsibility. You are witnesses of these things. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So God, in this moment, we ask you to forgive us. We repent for trying to live life our own way. God, you really can care less about wearing our Sunday best, suit and tie, and whatever it may be. What you care about is our obedience and our surrender. Help us to stop being so distracted by social media, by what somebody said. Help us to have a heaven focus. God, we want our change to be genuine, authentic. Come into our life and save us. We don't just celebrate the fact that you got up on today. We celebrate you all year round. Father, one who washes feet for a living. Forgive us as a nation for what we declare from our office as this being a special day that spits in your face and is not a day of reverencing you as king. We want to be clear, God, we're on your side. And we're so thankful that whatever happens in our life, there's the blood of the Lamb on the door of our soul. So we're in good hands. Help us to always remember that we have a responsibility. Forgive us for being Christians that want your blessings, but don't want obedience. We're asking that you do it in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. Were you blessed on today? Say, so were you blessed on today? everybody just say this after me God I surrender I'm done we're trying to do life my way save me 
from sin and save me from me save me from wrath the blood is enough now fill me with your Holy Spirit fill me with conviction fill me with joy so that I may be your witness all the days of my life I'm saved I'm sealed I'm yours in Jesus name amen you said that for the first time I want you to text the word fresh start to this number 844-484-0836